Hey friends, so now that you've taken a, a try at negotiating a peace treaty for World War I, I want to tell you what actually happened, and you can kind of compare this in your mind to what you thought might happen. So um, we had the four par main parties at the negotiations, and they all had a reason to want to blame Germany for World War I, even though technically you know, the declaration of war started with Austria, Hungary, and Russia. Germany was the first to attack, so that becomes the reason for blaming them. And um, they agreed to punish Germany harshly for that, maybe in an effort to get Germany to stop making future wars, or maybe just out of anger and frustration. Um, that included the equivalent of 33 billion US dollars in reparations, money to pay for the damages theoretically that were done to Britain and France. And all that money was to go to Britain and France primarily. They took away all of the submarines and other advanced technology that the German army had built up and redistributed that amongst France and Britain. And they took away all of Germany's colonies, um, and distributed them to France and Britain. And so um, in that way, Germany was set back the way that uh, the parties were hoping. Um, in addition, the parties agreed to create new nations where creating those new nations kind of hurt their former enemies, right? So they agreed to create the new nation of Poland, which took a bunch of land out of Germany. Um, and uh, they added this piece right here, which isn't traditionally part of uh, Poland, but, um, but which allows Poland access to the sea. And um, they broke apart what was Aust the Austria-Hungarian Empire and created the three nations of Czechoslovakia, Hungary, and Austria. And then they built a united, what was going to, the idea of a united Slavic state or pan-Slavic state here with Serbs and Croats in it, um, catering to the an idea that had been circulated before the war that Slavic people should have their own nation, but also taking away a piece of land that used to be part of Austria-Hungary and that Italy had wanted. They did give Italy a little bit of additional land up here where Austria, where it had been previously part of the Austria-Hungarian Empire. So this created a whole bunch of new nations and basically rewrote the entire map of Europe. You should also notice that the parts of Russia that had been given away uh, to Germany to get for, in order for Russia to get out of the war were um, created as independent nations of Lithuania, Latvia, and Estonia. Something that we didn't talk about in class, but which is really important, is that the um, British and French had promised Arab people formerly in the Ottoman Empire that if they helped the British and the French win World War I, they would get independent nations. Um, what the folks involved in those deals didn't know, including Lawrence of Arabia, who helped to negotiate them, and the Arab negotiators for that deal, is that France and Britain had already made a private agreement called the Sykes-Picot Agreement to divide up the Middle East between them in order to share access to what they understood to be oil reserves that they could exploit in the future. Um, so the excuse they gave was that they, they wanted to create these new nations, but they felt that the Arab leaders were not quite ready to run their own countries. So they created them as nations with names and Arab leaders but um, basically as colonies or sort of client states of France and Britain, protectorates is another word that was used. Um, so they built a bunch of uh, borders, you know, really based on this original Sykes-Picot agreement and not anything that the different Arab communities actually wanted. They created a bunch of uh, names and they, they um, used this as a way to exercise British and French dominance over the Middle East. And we still deal with the fact that these borders don't make a whole lot of sense from the point of view of who's living there and, um, and what their allegiances or beliefs are. 
They did agree to create the League of Nations, um, a weak League of Nations that would have no actual power to enforce any agreements. Um, and they did this mostly as a favor to the United States president, um, which you might have noticed in your own negotiations. However, when Woodrow Wilson got home to the United States, he found that his own government was unwilling to back the deal that he had made. The Congress of the United States, which has to approve treaties, uh, felt that the League of Nations would get the United States involved in foreign wars instead of protecting us from foreign wars. So here's a cartoon, a political cartoon from the time showing Uncle Sam, the symbol of the United States, you know, with his hands tied up and held by England and Japan and other European and foreign nations. The idea was that it was just getting the United States involved in other people's affairs and causing the United States to have to police and support other people's uh, issues. So Congress voted it down and the United States, um, as the originator of the idea of the League of Nations, never joined the League of Nations. And in that way, the League of Nations was additionally weakened and basically was unable to function according to any of the purposes that Woodrow Wilson had originally imagined. So if you think about what's happened here, it's pretty much the opposite of you know, making friends and making peace. Um, a lot of folks did not get what they needed or thought they needed out of this deal. And that sort of set up the conflicts that continue even to this day to some extent. Italy had joined the winning side and thought they were going to benefit from that and did not get very much land and, and or any colonies. In fact, Italy walked out of the negotiations midway through in real life. So if this happened to you in your simulation, don't sweat it. That was what really happened. Italy was just so angry with the rest of Europe um, that they that they couldn't take it anymore. Um, Germany was put in a bad situation because of the economic burden that was put on them on top of the four years of um, economic struggle that they'd had during the war. And um, they felt many Germans felt, you know, uh, betrayed by other Europeans put in a bad situation. Um, Japan felt like they had joined the, you know, the players and, and helped out in the war, and then they were treated in a racist way, their needs were ignored, and um, their ideas were, uh, were abandoned. Um, so Japan felt no real allegiance or concern for what was going on in Europe at that point, from that point forward. Um, and then all of the Arab in, independence fighters who felt that they had deserved, you know, and that they had uh, demonstrated their um, leadership in World War I were completely dissed by this agreement and could tell that France and Britain were really just taking over. Um, nobody was confused about that. So, and the borders that are really in some very awkward places continue to cause problems today. So there's pretty much no Middle East war that can't be traced back to the Sykes-Picot agreement and this original um, deal that's part of the package that was the Treaty of Versailles. So you already know that another war is coming, but hopefully now you can see some of the reasons why that war is coming and some of the failures of the peacemaking process. And I look forward to talking to, about it to you in class. And if you have questions about it for your homework, I hope you'll send me an email, send me a text. Um, I'm happy to talk more. Talk to you soon. Bye.